Hello, everyone. Um, I hope I think we're live. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in this uh, great discussion that I hope will be also very productive um, and eye opening. Uh, I would like to actually introduce some of these other guests that we have today. Um, we have Jeannie Suk Gerson. She is a professor at of law at Harvard Law School. Um, also Wesley well, Wesley Yang. Um, he's an author and essayist, which I'm sure that you guys are familiar with. Um, and then also Jonathan Herzog, who is a congressional candidate of New York's District 10. So I'm really excited to kick off this conversation. But um, Jonathan, would you like to take over? Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for joining us. So epic and awesome to see everyone here. Um, and you all know who Paget is. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the epic Yang Yang influencer in the house. Um, so I'll just give a brief um, kind of one or two line um, highlights about our, our guests today. Um, and then we'll dive right in. And I'll kind of frame the goal, um, hopefully, of these digital dialectics, what we hope to get out of it, um, and we'll go from there. So beginning with Wesley Yang, um, as Padgett told us, author and essayist, um, quote, one of the most provocative and heterodox writers on race and identity in America today, a columnist for a tablet magazine, contributing editor for Esquire, written extensively about the experience of Asian Americans in American society. Published his first book, The Souls of Yellow Folk in 2018, selected as a notable book of the year and one of the best books of the year by Spectator and Publisher Weekly. And we also have Jeannie Sue Gerson, uh, a Harvard law professor who teaches constitutional law, criminal law, family law, um, the law of art, fashion, performing arts, as well as being a contributing writer for The New Yorker, she clerked in the Supreme Court, worked in the Manhattan DA's office, um, has won countless accolades and awards, um, went to my alma mater, uh, Hunter College High School as well, <laughs> um, and Harvard Law School, where she was the first Asian American woman to receive tenure. Um, and you all know me, I'm Jonathan Herzog. I'm running for Congress in New York's 10th District. Um, I um, actually left Harvard Law School to join Andrew Yang's campaign as the sixth hire um, and build a campaign out in Iowa. Now running back home on the 10th district, the west side of Manhattan and South Brooklyn. So with that, let's dive right in. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna say one, one quick thing about, um, we've gotten a lot of questions about what is a dialectic? What is the point of a dialectic? Um, and how might this um, be different than a conversation or a podcast? The goal is for this to be a truth-ing process where we're actively investigating and pressing and exploring with the goal of applying a wide array of research and experience to policy, practice, and solutions. That's the overarching goal um, to actually move us forward and add value and create value over the course of bridging people with very, very different walks of life, perspective, um, and that's the goal of today. So to kick us off, I'm gonna read a couple of quotes <laughs> um, and then let Wesley, Jeannie, and Paget um, lead the dialectic from there. So Jeannie Sue Gerson is possibly the most interesting and relevant legal mind you've never heard of. Um, and recently in conversation with Wesley said, quote, it doesn't take a totalitarian government to repress our thoughts. We have done it ourselves. I just have a certain optimistic belief in reason. I'll self-correct if I turn out to be wrong. And I'll shut up after reading one more line from Wesley and let them take it away. Asian Americans are situated in this very liminal space. And that liminal space, that in-between, that border space, if you press on it hard enough, could potentially open new realities life, new realities up. Asian identity is at this fulcrum point, this odd man out, um, which culminates um, both in this traditional American hierarchy and the alternative progressive hierarchy, which culminates in the intersectional stack. 
this very liminality, this border case condition of the Asian American experience is going to allow the Asian person to say and to do things which white liberals are now afraid to say and do, which is to stand up for certain fundamental values. So with that as a framing, I welcome Jeannie, Wesley, and Paget. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, so Wesley, I would just be interested in you just, um, you know, explaining a little bit more about what you mean by this liminal space. Um, you know, if you have any specific examples, but just, you know, getting everyone up to speed on that. Well, I, th I think the paradigmatic case of it is um, specialized schools in New York City, right? And I guess I should provide some context about that. There, there's a, a set of very sort of storied um, institutions that are public schools that are, are based on uh, a model of um, so they're elite schools, right? But they're not elite in the sense that they have any more funding than any other New York City pub, uh, public school, nor do they have uh, a special group of teachers. They have the general run of New York City public school teachers, but they are schools that have a storied history where they've turned out Nobel Prize winners and, uh, and they have a demonstrated record of taking sort of immigrants from you know, uh, newcomers to this country and putting them on the path to upward mobility on the basis of educational attainments. And, um, and they've done this through a system where they, there's a test. There's a one test that you take to get in. And if you score above a certain threshold, you get in. And if you don't score uh, above that threshold, you don't get in. And um, it's been this way for many decades. In 1973, there was legislation that was passed in Albany making it so that the only way to get into these specialized high schools, which include uh, Stuyvesant and Bronx Science, was through the test. Um, and Asian Americans have come to be highly overrepresented within these schools. Um, they are 15% of the New York City population and they're more than 50% of the population that get into those schools. And so there is this, you know, there's this discourse about diversity, right? The schools are no longer diverse. They're heavily Asian American. Sort of the flagship school, uh, Stuyvesant, is more than 70% Asian American. And it's become more Asian American as time goes on as new waves of immigrants from China have moved into the school. So there's a movement to kind of, um, to, to sort of reverse this diversity, but the reversal of this diversity, which advertises itself sort of as a move against white supremacy, it actually means in practical terms, reducing the Asian population, Asian American population by more than a half. And the New York City Asian American population is in many ways distinct from the Asian population in the country as a whole, because Asian Americans as a group have the highest poverty rate in New York City, right? And so you have a lot of kids uh, going to these schools whose parents are working sort of multiple shifts as mm -hmm. delivery men or uh, in, in, the, in, in the garment district and so on. And so here we have a public school system from which sort of the white middle class has largely absconded for various reasons, right? Like into the private schools, because uh, I, I think whites are, are less than 15% of, of the New York City public school population, although they are more than 15% of the, of the overall city population as a whole. So they've given up on this institution, but there's one sort of area that, that continues to work for its intended purpose. And you have Asian Americans that uh, are, they are stating a claim. They are defending, <laughs> they're defending the legitimacy of a system where there is a particular relationship between effort and reward. Right. And this is one of the values that sort of Asian Americans are able to to stand up on and to say that, no, it isn't just whiteness. Right. It isn't just white supremacy that determines where you end up within an educational hierarchy. Right. Like it, it happens to be the case that these measures that advertise themselves as assaults on white supremacy are actually assaults on the opportunities and chances in many cases of lower income Asian American people that happen mm -hmm. to live in New York City. That's the fact. It's being presented in a way, often in the New York Times and elsewhere, that is quite distinct from the reality on the ground. And you have a group of people that are organizing to defend that system. Now, 
I don't necessarily think that sort of the Asian American way or sort of the Asian way of doing things is necessarily the optimal way of doing things. And yet right. it's a system that works very well for a particular group of people, they're going to continue to do it. And the question is whether they have a right to defend themselves. So in a sense, like I'm not really defending the system as it is. I'm defending the right, right though, of these people as enfranchised citizens within a democracy to defend their own stake in this. And they have a real stake in this. And the real stake that they have in it also serves as a broader bulwark against a kind of general anti-testing ethos mm -hmm. that, of course, like testing went too far under No Child Left Behind, right? And so like, because testing went too far, we had high stakes testing with the threat of pulling money away from low performing school districts. And of course, no money was ever actually pulled away from anyone because nobody got close to the like the unrealistically high standard that was placed, right? Like the, the idea was, was that 100% of all of our students we're going to meet a certain quantitative standard and pass a certain set of tests. And that was something that was done by sort of first Republicans and then, and then by the Obama administration. And it was never realistic. Nobody got within, you know, within a hundred yards of the purported goal. And in the process, there was all of this testing that was done that turned everybody off of testing. But, and, and so at the same time, then you have this like other group of outsiders who are culturally normed to societies that so happen to determine the life chances of their children on the basis of a single test and who come to dominate that test when they are injected into the system, right? Um, right. So it, here we have an example of a sort of like an anti-meritocratic movement that goes too far coming up against like a meritocratic group of people whose like commitments to a certain kind of strict meritocracy also probably goes too far. And yet like is within that group proven to be a very functional means for them to, um, to advance within society. And do they have a right to like, are they playing an ultimately kind of salutary role in, uh, in, in defending that system? And I think that I want it. I think that they do. So, yeah. Yeah, yes, I want to bring in Jeannie quickly on this because you actually were were at the recent um, Harvard admissions trial, and um, and I want to frame this as a thesis and antithesis. So thesis being, um, let's start with Jeannie and 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 Wesley's take essentially. Jeannie's mm -hmm. being, let's say, I don't want to put. put words in your mouth, but there's an anti-Asian bias, not affirmative action being on trial. And you can kind of frame and explain what the Harvard admissions case was. And this relates to Wesley's case that specialized high school admissions um, in New York City in particular um, offered this uh, pathway, this escape from, from poverty in New York City. Um, and we can um, frame within that um, potentially comparisons with the Gaokao or Hagwans if we want to. The antithesis, though, is what Andrew Yang re recently described in an interview with Barry Weiss. And essentially, he framed it as Harvard's going to Harvard. And I think one of the, the um, incredible transformative powers of the Asian man who loves math was to say, by the data, 67% of Americans will not attend a four-year uh, college or university. Most Americans, tens of millions, live in precarity as, in high school educated gig economy jobs. And so these, these issue on the fringes, they should remain on the fringes and fights that maybe don't dominate the space of public discourse. So with that as the framing, um, and maybe those aren't intention, I wanna um, bring, in, bring in Jeannie on this. Well, so it, I think that um, you started by asking about the two distinct issues, in my mind, they're distinct issues that of course come together in the Harvard case. One is what do you do about possible anti-Asian bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, could be completely implicit bias in admission systems. The other is what do we do about affirmative action? Now they are coexisting in the Harvard case overall. It so happens that the trial that I attended in uh, last fall was mainly about the issue of anti-Asian bias and that that's, that's the trial issue. But the larger issue of what do we do about affirmative action 
that is an issue that has a, a, a long history and will continue to be litigated even after um, after the Harvard trial ended. So I I tend to think that whether we're talking about Stuyvesant and Hunter, Hunter where both Jonathan and I attended, um, specialized high schools or colleges, at the end of the day, what we really are talking about is social engineering. We care about who gets into these schools because we think that they are producing citizens, individuals who are gonna go out in the world and play some role in our society. And so we're trying to engineer who gets to be in places of leadership and of contribution with the education that is offered at these schools. So whether it's high school, elementary school or college, that's really, and if there's an admission system, it's social engineering, that's what's going on. Now, given that that's the case, I, I would say I would, I would prefer to see the conversation happen along those lines, as opposed to, um, as opposed to some reflection on merit or who deserves it, um, who has worked hard enough or who has talent or who has, um, you know, who has the, the resources. And it seems to me that um, when the Asian American community is feeling like they are being discriminated against because of these admissions processes, right? They have reason to feel that, um, like it's kind of like the rug being pulled out from under their, um, under them where they've worked really hard, they've done what, they followed the instructions, Asians, you know, a lot of the time, they think that when you follow instructions, it's going to work out the way it's supposed to. And part of it is that they are, they are thinking that that's what matters. Well, what matters with these schools is is really that social engineering piece. And I think that it, it would be better if Asian Americans got themselves out of the mindset of merit and did I deserve it and did I work hard enough and more into this collective conversation about what kind of society we want to live in and how do these schools fit in that kind of society. And so therefore the admission system should be should be uh, made to kind of correspond to what we want. And in that way, I, I think it's a, a really a, a terrible thing that schools cannot be just transparent and honest about the social engineering goal to such an extent that they could even say, what we are looking for is a certain cross-section of the community. We are not looking for an all Asian school. We are not looking for an all white school. We're not looking for a school that's dominated only by one group year after year um, for whatever reason, even if that group, you know, has all the has all the tricks to be able to do well on a test. Um, and so at that point, you know, to, to be able to change for the Asian American community to also engage in this dialogue and understand that they they play a role in this social engineering project and that they too should participate in that conversation about how to make our admission system such that we can very properly and justly engage in that design of our social society and our, our future leadership. So that's why the, the whole language of merit and, and just desserts is, it's, it's, I think it's a misfit and that's what leads to a, a, a breakdown in conversation. Yeah. I can I add go ahead. About it. I think this, um, I, I, from my perspective, I feel like this actually broadens, like, this leads to a bigger question, um, you know, which is opportunities for Asian Americans in general in America, right? Like, what, like, what has society, and what you're talking about, social engineering, what has society in America set up? as the opportunities where Asian Americans can succeed. We are, you know, um, constantly discriminated against when, and maybe it's a chicken and egg a little bit, but discriminated against when it comes to leadership roles, right? Like we're not seen as some, like as the sports person or, you know, um, the political leader or anything like that. So I think it does kind of have to open up that conversation. Like, well, like how have we socially engineered our society to discriminate against Asian Americans and say, look, this is, and so this is the only way you can succeed, which is studying hard, you know, um, getting certain grades, going to a certain college so that at least on your resume, you can say that you have these things. So you are a valuable part of society because otherwise, 
what opportunities are there for you? Um, you're, you're constantly seen as alien in America. And, and that is just that is just a fact. We don't have these kind of conversations. When we're talking about African-American communities. We don't have to have these conversations. When we talk about Latino American communities, why do we always have to have these conversations about whether or not Asian Americans deserve something just because we're Asian American? I understand that we exist in this certain kind of space. And, you know, a lot of us are... Um, are foreign born and everything like that. But I think that's a bigger question too, is like how have Asian Americans in general just been pigeonholed by society at large to only be able to see that avenue as the only avenue for them to be able to succeed? Um, you know, and so I think maybe there is a chicken and the egg to that, but I would push back a little bit on this Harvard admissions thing just simply because, you know, I mean, and I will talk about merit a little bit because that is that is the lane that they were given, you know, to to be able to have a certain kind of life and to be able to follow a certain kind of American dream that was really set up for them. But, um, you know, what other American dream is there for Asian Americans to come over here? And they are, you know, they are having to struggle against so many different odds. And, and including that is the fact that Asian American issues, Asian American discrimination, anti-Asian racism is not talked about enough. We do not have that social structure the way African Americans do. Like we, we're, we're not accustomed to being like, you know what, you're Asian American, let me help you out. Like, let me reach down and like help you out. You know, we don't have that in place. It's all just about, we're all out for ourselves um, because we haven't been given that sort of, we don't have that structure yet, that social structure. So what other options do we have, I guess, is what I'm saying, is like, we don't have any other advantages, <laughs> if that makes any sense. I don't know. Well, I mean, something that I wrote about um, and something that sort of motivated my interest in Andrew Yang was, of course, that, you know, there's no discourse, there's no pre-existing discourse, and there is no yearning in this, you know, for an Asian American president, right? There's no, there's a long litany of the next sort of uh, identity category that um, that we that we await their emergence uh, as national political figures, and of course, th this was the sort of this was the sort of awkwardness that that Andrew would uh, have to sort of confront through his little jokes about Asian Americans, right? And he would do this because here he is on a national debate stage, presidential debate stage. Um, and there's an Asian man that's up there and it's the first thing that anybody perceives, right? But like, we don't actually have any sort of language for talking or thinking about what that means. And certainly there isn't, there isn't a pent up identity political discourse or demand for him to be there. And so there's something sort of faintly comic about it, right? And that sort of faintly comic aspect of it was something that he ended up sort of leaning into with those little jokes in a way that I think has a lot to do with like how one goes through mm -hmm. graduating from Exeter and going to Brown as an Asian dude, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's this kind of like nervous jokiness that one gets into, um, but it actually served a function. Like when, and I saw it serve a function when, mm -hmm. when I was up in New Hampshire. Right. Uh, and he was, you know, there would be a room sort of full of, you know, older white rural folks seeing this person, um, you know, this Asian American man saying, I want to be your president. And there was a sort of tension in the room that would release when he would acknowledge the fact that, like, I'm an Asian man, uh, you know, I'm an Asian man who likes math. Right. And, and, and sort of setting up a contrast between himself and Donald Trump. It was kind of a labored joke. But like there would be an extra degree of kind of relief and catharsis, right? In the moment that he did it, there was a reason to do it. It worked better in those settings than it ultimately did on national TV. Um, but like all of this like underscores the fact that, uh, you know, I think in reply to your question, like why, you know, it's like, look, <laughs> we're a 70% foreign born community. Right, mm -hmm. uh, Asian Americans like we're mostly uh, we're mostly immigrants or the children of immigrants, and there are certain cultural priors that are being brought here and mass. And with respect to the sort of social engineering aspect that Jeannie was talking about, Harvard arrogates to itself the discretion to do that. Right, like they believe like they're doing the best job, and and of course the problem that they face right now is that 
they have they they hold in balance sort of three different commitments that are that are held sincerely, right? Like sort of the way that you sort of maximize your sort of um, your gatekeeping ability, right? You, the way you maximize your sort of cartel power over the minting of an elite as a private institution is to hold in balance sort of inherited wealth, right? That is a part of what Harvard is there for. And, and with merits, you want to be able to make the claim that you're the smartest people. And then to say that, you know, we also advance the highest, most progressive values. We're committed to social justice, right? Uh, in the form of diversity. And, and you're trying to hold these three things in balance. And they, you know, for, for many decades, they were held in balance very well, but sort of airdropping into this society, right? Like uh, uh, a minority of people from societies that have been determining the, the life chances of their children on the basis of a single test for a thousand years. You do that and it, it unsettles things. It puts things at balance. There are both recipients of affirmative action and then there's like more than one now, market dominant minority, right? That, that like is scores off the charts. Right. In a way that like causes problems if you have an admission system that's based upon this polite fiction and genius talked about this, that like, oh, we're not going to openly social engineer, we're not going to racially balance. Those things are unconstitutional while diversity is OK. And we ended up with a situation where the only way we could actually do that is by sort of systematically denigrating one group by saying, oh, they actually fall short on this other thing because they did so well on both the, um, the, both the sort of um, quantitative measures on the grades. And then of course they became conscious that, oh, you gotta do extra quick activities. And so they got to the point where like on average, they have better extra critical activities than the average, their, their sort of white counterpart, right? And they maxed out on everything that they could max out on. And so the last dimension upon which they were being judged is personal qualities. This was the area of greatest discretion on their part and in order for them to maintain this fiction that we're not going to racially balance, right? They, they had to say, oh, well, this group that, that, that dominates here is not present at, at numbers that are consistent with what that dominant, dominance would then imply in terms of the outcome because they are lacking in these other qualities, right? And of course that happens to dovetail and fit in very nicely, all too nicely, right? With pre-existing stereotypes that also happen to exist. And, and, and given the kind of, and Jeannie knows this, the intense emotional investment that Asian Americans have in Harvard, to have Harvard be forced by this litigation to go before a judge and make that argument, right? Um, that no, these people are actually just lacking in personal qualities. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so devastating. And at the same time, like they're just gonna take it, right? Such is their enthrallment to it. Like it's not gonna actually like make them any less enthralled to the mystique of this, of this institution because that's the way, those, those are the cultural priors that these people are bringing with them. So you, you parachute a group of people who have these cultural priors, who act on them, and then, and then, of course, like it, of course, it's going to have all these feedback effects that then like generate stereotypes around people that then themselves become a kind of straitjacket that prevent people from being able to do all kinds of other things, like be seen as leaders, be seen as interesting, be seen as dynamic, be seen as funny. And so, so like this thing that like already is a question of like, well, how do you adjust to this new country given what your cultural priors are, is like has this other thing that is added on top of it. And then you have Harvard saying, oh, these people lack personal qualities. And not only do they say that, but there's this amazing moment in the Harvard Crimson that I'm gonna talk about where uh, sort of the, the, the attorney who, um, he came to Harvard Law School. He didn't just come to the, the college as a whole. He came to the law school and he was speaking to his students uh, uh, and he made a kind of flippant comment saying, well, I guess, Asian Americans, you know, just have worse personalities than, you know, he was talking about the affirmative action than blacks and Hispanic and a dozen people spontaneously said they do, right? Like, or they, they, they sort of, and they were, they were not coordinated. They were all just acting on, but it was as if they were coordinated, right? Like they all were, were responding to the same ambient cues in the environment that caused each one of those individuals, a dozen of them was what the reporting said, or at least a dozen of them, Harvard Law students in that room to say, yes, of course, the reason is, is that these people are deficient, 
right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and so, like, the thing with Yang is sort of like, you know, and I had this, I had this talk with him, and I was like, because in his first book, he writes about both, like, how many, uh, how much he could bench, and he also writes about what his, and he says, you know, he scored, uh, what did he score on the LSAT? He scored like two below the highest you could score. And I was like, you were an Asian dude that scored really high on your LSAT, right? Nobody was gonna, nobody was gonna make you be president. No one was gonna take you under their wing and say like, this man needs to be president. Like there's no pipeline for that, yeah. right? But like, so, and I came to see him as this kind of like spy within the American elite, who at some point saw the fragility that was there. And it's like, oh, all I have to do actually is just like announce myself on Twitter and I can actually be a contender for the presidential because like he was enough of the spy behind the scenes where he actually saw that there was no there there, right? Like he saw that like, if you had a, a, a vision from out of nowhere that happened to correspond with the moment that like you could, you could launch yourself into the presidency. So it's like in those terms that like he became like an interesting figure to me and he, you know, he actually, he actually proved it. So like Yang is about my age. So like, I feel like I know him. I feel like he was a guy that I knew at gifted camp and, 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 and Beto is a guy who's about my age. And I feel like I know him. So like I joked on Twitter early on that like the real, the real thing for me, the real thing for me is like Yang versus Beto, right? And if Yang beats Beto, and of course, this was when Beto was on the cover of Vanity Fair. That it was just a joke. Like, of course, Yang wasn't going to beat Beto, right? But like, he he beat Beto, right? Like, and so, and and so, like, for a certain kind of Asian American man, I think like that was that was like a great, it was a great victory, right? Oh yeah, yeah. and and I, I wanna... completely yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So there, there's so much. Um, to, uh, to unpack here. And I want to try to broaden the scope a bit um, um, and maybe even use Wesley's language to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll just pull just two, two quick quotes um, as maybe a bridge. One is, Wesley, you've described your work as foregrounding the Asian American identity and using it as a foil and proxy for the larger set of themes you want to deal with. The other bit I want to pull um, is We've referenced at many points this notion of polite fiction, of thinly veiled falsehoods, of narratives and stories that behind which institutions and their facades crumble. And you you noted the disorienting gap between the polite myths of liberal society and then the way that people actually experience the world and the effect of the internet in particular in blowing this gap wide open. And I think this is so deeply tied to the, the Yang Gang and the Yang campaign in particular, but this moment in time. Um, and I want to flesh out this puncturing of truth, uh, puncturing of, of silence. And, um, and there's, you know, I, I studied psychology. And so the, the, the oldest reference point is the Solomon Ash studies, where there's a group of people in a room and they're, they're asked to look at a... Um, uh, series of, of lines with different links. And they're asked one by one in turn, well, which line is the longest or which line is the shortest? And most of the room are plants there uh, in partnership with the, the scientists running the experiment. And one by one by one, they say line C is the longest when clearly it's not. And by the time they get to the last person in that row, they're thinking to themselves, they're sweating, they're like, Maybe I'm the crazy one. I've been gaslit person by person by person. It must be line C. And so over time, they are able to get a significant percentage of people to say that what is objectively, visibly not the case is in fact the case. But what they found is that just one person, one person in that line over the course of those people saying which line is the longest, saying the truth, gave freedom and significantly lowered the percentage of people who just went along with the crowd and said, well, yeah, it's line C. So, so I want to draw out and again, broaden the scope of this to say this, I think, is so fundamental 
to politics, to policy, to institutional collapse, which I think one broader theme is we're in the midst of for the over the span of decades, whether that be in our trust and faith in higher education, in our healthcare system, in Congress, in our policing uh, and criminal justice system. One of the radical truths that Andrew brought to the fore and punctured the silence on was his saying that the Democratic Party in particular has too much faith, excessive faith in institutions and not in people. Mm -hmm. And it was heresy. It was heresy to say that we should put cash directly into people's hands. So heretical that a Republican state had had that policy for 40 years. So heretical that members of the Trump administration, Justin Amash, Rashida Tlaib, AOC, Bernie, people from all walks of political partisanship now today amidst COVID support. So I just want to broaden the scope because I think there is so much power um, in what this narrative centers around, which is puncturing that silence and pulling back the veil behind the lies. Uh, well, uh, somebody else want to take this one? <laughs> Jeannie, do you want to um, do you want to <laughs> comment on that? Because uh, yeah, I, that was a lot, Jonathan. That was a, <laughs> um, and I'm not really sure even like where you, where you start to comment on that um, in the framework of where so, we are. Yeah. So, so maybe one specific starting point for, for Jeannie um, is, I don't want to stray too far, but, but the language um, of, of trauma. Um, and I think you've, you've written so compellingly about um, the, medicalization of trauma and the use of post-traumatic stress disorder as a framing for speech as violence um, and the idea of freezing um, in the classroom, for example. Uh, so maybe uh, trauma is a, a useful lens as a starting point. Okay, so let me start with the general frame, which I take, Jonathan, to be really asking about our ability to tell the truth. Yes. Just as individuals. Point and, blank. Yeah, like just really be able to say, we see just that basic example of you see something, can you actually tell the Identify truth? Identify it for what it is. See, um, first of all, perceive it accurately. And then beyond perceiving it accurately, there's a whole process whereby you, you debate within yourself whether you should say the thing that you perceive, and then also have some doubts about whether you are perceiving it the way it is if everyone around you is perceiving it differently from you. So I think it's just that uh, this is the basic, the basic problem, Jonathan, that, that you're getting at, which is how has our ability to tell the truth, it's always been difficult, I think, but how has it gotten even harder? Yes, why has that eroded what can we do about it? And how can we create better and new institutions and alternatives and cultivate people to be more likely and able to tell the truth? Right. So now connecting back to what you're saying about Andrew's campaign, I do not think the answer is issuing institutions. And, and I'm not saying he does either, but um, I don't think that this, um, the, the dichotomy between institutions and people um, and emphasizing that and then really championing individuals versus institutions. That's not the direction that I would go in because sometimes it is institutions that the, the strength of them, the security that they provide, that can provide people the ability to say, I don't have to actually go with the, the crowd. I don't have to go with the herd. I don't have to go with what everybody else is saying because I have security in this institution. That's one of the things that has been very disturbing about the Trump presidency, as many, many people have remarked. As our institutions become undermined by constant erosion of their norms and of denigration of their processes and professional standards, we also see that it's harder and harder for individuals within them and outside of them to tell the truth about what's going on. I think strong institutions don't necessarily mean 
that what we see is a total conformity of how people see the world and um, their ability to talk about it. In in fact, uh, that that backing that you have, knowing that there's an institution that defends things like the freedom of speech, um, that defends people who believe in you know the truth about science. Um, that those kinds of things are really what individuals need. It's not, it, it's not going to be enough for individuals to have their own se sense of bravery and strength. Sometimes people say about things that I write, and I'm sure that Wesley has s heard the same thing about his writing, like, wow, you are um, brave to say that. And honestly, um, I do not think that um, the correct rubric is bravery. I actually think it's a feeling of security, a feeling of security that you're not going to be killed as a result of what you say. And you're not going to that's be being that's being very gentle, Jeannie. I mean, like you and Wesley and Andrew are like, you're not just called brave. You are attacked. You are gaslit. I mean, the 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 <laughs> level of deliberate, um, I mean, <laughs> misinterpretation, yeah. misrepresentation, mischaracterization, just the hate and the, I mean, like it is, I mean, that, that goes beyond just, oh, you're, you're brave, you're courageous. There is something unique and it could be a part of the institutions that, as you said, provide that haven, provide that security or about you as individuals that help you withstand and overcome and recognize um, the trolls for what they are. But I mean, let's not, you know, <laughs> let's, let's be accurate about the level of gaslighting that goes on with your work in particular, with Wesley and yours and Andrew's. What, well, what's the gaslighting? I'm sorry, I, I, you have to catch me up to speed on like what exactly um, is this gaslighting? Am I going to be one of those? Am I one of those people who would be the gaslighter? Um, no, not at all. You're, you're, you're one I, of the rare exceptions, Paget. I mean, I don't want to pull apart like the the worst like shit that's been thrown on the internet, but I mean, right. take even the um, Andrews op-ed recently as an example. We were discussing this earlier, that's good, right? That's a good example. Um, where uh, this this fairly anodyne take one could say, which is like, be civically engaged, be a good citizen, take care of others, um, set an example, was then construed deliberately by leading Asian American elite voices, the media personalities, and otherwise, as like, oh, you're a self-hating Asian, essentially. Well, so, okay, Jonathan, I'm gonna actually say that you probably did not see my video where I actually did disagree with his op-ed. And I know that I was in the minority in terms of his um, supporters, because you know that I am a big supporter of his, and I rarely ever disagree with him, but, um, actually, the way I even found that article, just to be, just so it's not like I was looking um, for a way to be offended by it, is my friend literally texted me, just the last expert, the last paragraph, he just texted that to me. I hadn't even seen the op-ed, didn't know Andrew Yang did an op-ed. I read the last paragraph and I literally texted him back. I was like, what the hell is this shit? Um, who wrote, like, can you send me the whole article? I completely disagree with this. And then he was like, Andrew, and then he sent me Andrew Yang's tweet. And I was like, why would Andrew Yang tweet this? And then I looked at it and it was his own piece. And then I was like, crap. Like I'm not looking for reasons to not to disagree with Andrew Yang. I agree with him on nearly everything, but you know, my particular you know, perspective, and I'm not coming from this woke culture of, and in, in fact, I actually disagree a lot with these Asian American elites who, yeah, they just scream about everything. They screamed at Andrew Yang for his math jokes, which I totally understood why he did that. He did it to disarm people. He did it to disarm white people to make them feel comfortable with him. That's fine. I get it. Right. Um, but the op-ed, the reason why I guess it, I took contention with it is that um, it didn't also have a very, very important piece of the puzzle, which is that Asian Americans themselves, they we need to do a better job. And I'm putting it on Asian Americans too, right? Um, first of all, you know, denouncing the hate, but then also saying Asian Americans, we need to do a better job at speaking up for ourselves, standing up for ourselves, right? Like, um, you know, not just conforming to the model minority, not just wearing your red, white, and blue and doing all the, you know, whatever things that people, people want you to be, which is the nice Asian American who's gonna follow the rules. We need to, you know, it goes deeper than just not getting attacked. For me, Asian American, you know, issues, it, it, it goes to 
social respect, because that's the thing that I think as a whole, we really lack. And I think you see that when it comes to the emasculation of Asian American men, you see it in Hollywood, you know, how, how does a whole race become emasculated? You emasculate the, the men, right? And it's very true today. So I'm trying to talk. So it was really offensive to me because I, I look for social respect for the Asian American community, you know, African Americans, they have fought for it. They have fought for it hard with each other. They have united. Um, and Asian Americans, we have not done enough of it. Am I saying that's the only piece of the puzzle? Absolutely not. You know, yes, step up. Yes, help your fellow Americans. But, um, you know, it, it, it requires more than just following the rules and being a good citizen. It also demands a certain level of courage to stand up and say, look, I socially, I respect myself and I'm not going to let you treat me that way. Now I can help my, you know, and I can also help my neighbors and everything like that. But don't you dare, like, you know, throw that shit at me because I grew up in an all white community, you know, an Asian Asian guy was a popular dude. Um, but the only way he became popular is if he sub, like, he was basically subservient to the white guys that he hung out with. They literally would throw small penis jokes at him all the time, and he had to just sit there and take it and laugh it off, like it didn't mean anything. That is not true social freedom, that is not true social respect. So that is what I took contention with, is it did not go far enough in the ways that Asian Americans need to go in order to see true progress in this in, in, my, in the country. This is just from my perspective, but anyway. I think that what, uh, for what I take to be the, the nub of the issue with that op-ed that Asian Americans, some of them had big problems with, is the implication, it was not stated explicitly, but it was an implication that lots of people drew from it, that um, in order to prove that you're really American, you should be going out there and doing certain things to really show and demonstrate. For example, helping people through the coronavirus, co contributing in very real ways, um, instead of complaining about the discrimination. Uh, and that, that impression was conveyed in one particular phrase where he said something, we have to do something we've never done before. So suggesting that, stating <laughs> that we've never done it before, right? And, Did he and say so, that never done before? I, I, I believe he said that we have to do something that hasn't been done before. And, and that, so, and, and so like that was either. that was like an awkward, that was an awkward phrase that ended up conveying that impression. And, mm -hmm. and I think actually, rightly <laughs> like people like people took that the implication correctly from that phrase but like on the whole you know the message was kind of um the message was sort of like he sort of he sort of accepted the idea that like there's a there's a big rise in hate crimes against asia i don't know if that's really right like there there's been there's this hate crime sort of discourse that's been going on ever since 2016 and you know if you sort of dive down into the numbers, there's often less than meets the eye, although there, of course, there have been very spectacular, terrible incidents, right? And, and that probably don't have zero to do with some of the rhetoric coming from the president. But, um, but, but like, like I, I don't like, I think like six months from now, if, if there were to be like a quantitative survey of the number of hate crimes against Asian Americans, I. I, I don't think it, I don't actually think, right, like we're going to see like this enormous or meaningful rise. I could be wrong. That's that could happen, but. It's possible, but eight, eight crimes are, I mean, those are extreme incidents, right? Those are, they're really extreme incidents. I think a lot of what people have been talking about in yeah. things, it, it, they don't amount to hate crimes. They are just things that make li life a little more unpleasant. Um, some hostility here and there that sure. was not as common before uh, and became a little bit more, more common during this period. And I think that those are anecdotal experiences that might not actually, you're right, show up on like surveys and data and, you know, hate crime um, tabulations. I mean, Graham Wood sort of tweeted, um, maybe it's not such a bad thing in the midst of a pandemic for people to think they have to stay six feet away from me, right? So um but you know uh sure it's a thing um and and it was it was awkwardly phrased and it was, awkwardly phrased. And, and, it was and it was in keeping with the kind of general 
the sort of general tenor of his of his views on things. I mean, he, he he's open. He you know openly stated to me in an interview, you know, like part of the reason for the Asian jokes is to show that I'm not a woke scold, right? And I'm um, not a what? A woke scold, right? Like like uh -huh. I'm not here to kind of like give everybody a hard time about my race. And I I, I just like I, he wants to signal that, but like it it's also just true, right? And and so. I also don't think it's, it was only about an, an audience of white people. You know, when you make jokes about your ethnicity, your race, and sometimes, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm constantly talking in front of students. Have I, you know, made jokes about my own ethnicity? Of course I have. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes it's not necessarily only about making white students comfortable. It's really about making, you know, a connection with everyone, including Asian people who are listening. And in, in the times when I heard Andrew do this, in, in this event that, that Jonathan organized where I interviewed Andrew, and he did that a lot during that event with an audience wow. of maybe like 200 people, largely Asian American yeah. uh, students. And he did it a ton. And a lot of it was like, there is a recognition some of it is making fun of the stereotype. Some of the it is embracing and saying, there's really actually nothing wrong with being good at math. Like it's not something you need to run from as a stereotype. It's if you were good at math. That's a very useful way yeah. to test reality, but yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think most- it doesn't, I don't think any of them were offended in those settings for the most, like I don't think any of those Asian American people are offended. I don't think most yeah, Asian I, people are offended. I wasn't offended by when he did like an Asian man who likes math. I thought he went, I think sometimes like it was just the judgment part of it in terms of like, did you do it a little bit too much just because it's making everyone's skin crawl? Um, not because of an Asian American kind of aversion to it, but it was like, sometimes he would do he would lean into it a little too much and then it became not funny anymore <laughs> because he was leaning on it way too much. But um, yeah, I, 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 I like that's, that's the thing is that it's not like I was one of the Asian Americans who were like, Oh, I hate how he leans into stereotypes. I hate how he tries to do that. I, I totally understood it from a human political perspective. Um, you know, it is strange to see an Asian American, anyone running for president. Like that is something that, like you said, Wesley, that he walks on the stage and you're like, what is this? This is like a new kind of beast. Like, I have no idea how to take this in. Like, is he joking? And then he cracks that joke. And then it's like this release of sort of like the tension of like, okay, so he sees like, he gets it. Like, or, you know, we have this sort of like shared sort of experience of like, this is unusual for an Asian man to be running for president. Um, that's all fine. It's just, um, I just wish sometimes that he would just like say everything that he's saying too, except for the things that we've never done before. That should be taken, that should have been taken out. But say all the things that he's saying, but then also advocate for an Asian American strength. That, that's actually my only yeah. real critique about him in general when he talks about stuff like that. Um, and I don't know if it's because he's writing on white media, so he doesn't want to alienate his like white supporters because apparently he does sound different when he's just talking on Asian American platforms, um, my friend pointed out. So, but I don't know. I mean, it's politics, right? It's it's really, it all comes down to your supporter base. And unfortunately, um, but it's, yeah. So I'd like to get, I'd like to get back. <laughs> so returning to that the, that point, Wesley, about that awkward sentence or that awkward transition, um, I think this goes exactly to Jonathan's question about truth telling. Um, in a way, what he was saying, um, even though it was written in a, in a, in a, on a platform that that reached lots of non Asians, what he what I understood him to be saying is something that possibly I could have said. Um, to a group of students, and maybe I even have said to Asian students, which is, you know, there's a lot about Asian culture that um, may be very influential in how you conduct yourself in the world, and some of it is great. One thing that, it, you know, th their numbers don't lie, there's like very little um, relative participation among Asians in things like politics and voting rates um, and things like, and civic engagement. Those are things that we need to work on as a community. And so in effect, if what Andrew was saying was like, you know, yes, we are, are right now experiencing some discrimination as a result of the coronavirus and the, the president calling it a Chinese virus and all that. Yes, we are. But let's turn that energy 
into civic engagement and of contributing to the society. Let's let's make something productive of it, um, and really like you know really show ourselves what we can do. I think that if that had been written in some Asian American paper, it would have been like not very not very um, objectionable. It's really the idea that the audience that he was talking to was white people that it, it bothered, I think, a lot of Asians. Because, yeah, exactly. Because they thought that he was, or I, I thought when I first read it, that it was like signaling to non-Asian people that like your anger and frustration and violence toward us is totally justified. And let's not talk about that because that's mm -hmm. uncomfortable um, as opposed to taking a clear stand and just saying like, that is flat like it's just it's just wrong um because i don't even think that article said that but i appreciated all the rest of his article it was very honest you know um you know earnest about yeah. him being an asian american person in this time um and but that i appreciated. I, that I agree with you in the end that he got like he got flamed you know for trying to tell a truth about something and the the truth that I would locate is, um, you know, part of the reason we haven't seen a lot of Asians in politics is it comes down to a lot of cultural reasons that Asians aren't um, putting themselves out there. And of course there's, you know, discrimination and, and other structural reasons, but you know, what kind, you know, we don't, Asian families don't generally think to themselves, like I really want to raise a child to run for public office and do the kinds of things that get you out there in that way. Um, and I think part of what he was getting out of that op-ed is like, okay, now that we, we, are, we can be galvanized by being sort of collectively the victims of discrimination in this exact time, let's use this exact time to productively contribute and to give something and to help um, in addition to noting that we're being discriminated against. So yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree with that. Um, I wish he was, he was uh, uh, just a little bit more explicit about that. Like, this is the time to become a leader. Um, I don't think he actually said that exactly in the op-ed. When I read that, I'm just talking about the op-ed. I don't know what he said afterwards. I haven't really followed it. Um, you know, to be a political leader, to you know, be that person that people can actually like look up to and have strength in that. Like, I. I it, I would have loved actually if someone just went in and just edited it for him. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of a tweaking. And then I think like a lot less people would have had issue with it, yeah. including me. Um, so, so there's, yeah, so I want to give space to, to uh, Wesley to comment on this. And then I want to force us to pivot a little bit. But Wesley, go first. I actually wanted to go back to the thing that you were talking about uh, with respect to truth telling and so on. Um, you know, there's a there's a process by which sort of new ideas are uh, there's a are injected into society and their activist movements whose purpose is to to change the world in various ways and that 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 process of metabolization involves kind of it, it's always a little edgy right and it's always a little awkward and um, and and the 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 the, pro the the problem that we face today is that precisely it is the content of those ideas and and this is of course what 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 Jeannie is working on those ideas actually do sort of because the process of metabolization re revolves around there being a kind of meta discursive set of rules of engagement right but like these the the, the kind of new doctrines that are emerging attack those meta discursive rules about about like sort of free speech and, and open exchange right like they 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 sort of they they uh, sort of they define um, they define certain forms of offense giving or offense taking as as um, you know they 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 freight it with kind of like emotional baggage and and uh, I, I, you know they construe disagreement as an attack on the person and so on and so forth. And so it's very difficult for that metabolism process to happen, right? Where we sort of, yes, of course, there's a moral purpose behind these attempts to make our society more inclusive, to recognize forms of harm that were unrecognized in the past, right? Like there's, there's value to those things. And yet 
to do it while sort of in, in, engaging in a frontal assault on what allows us to kind of separate the the, the, the valuable from the you know from the sort of the dangerously overwrought or you know like there has to be a process of give and take by which we arrive at like a new consensus that takes into account right like the the new forms of the recognition of harm and new forms of sensitivity that want to be taken on board without throwing without the baby out with the bathwater people uh, managing to sort of hijack the sort of disciplinary function of institutions in order to win these debates by default right like you sort of define so like the sort of paradigmatic sort of microaggressive example that I give is like it has been defined at UC Berkeley as a microaggression to say America is a melting pot, right? Like that was once part of the sort of the common wisdom of American elites and American culture, right? And it was contested at the time, but like it eventually sort of like had to do with like the mid-century American consensus that we were a melting pot. And of course it was never it was never really true and it was never, but it, like it, it functioned as a way for us to live together within diversity. And there, there are, there, there are those who now want to reject this and they don't want to sort of argue about whether we are or not, or whether we should qualify. They want to define it out of existence as a harm that has to be suppressed, right? Rather than something that you have to make an argument about. Right, rather than something that like you have to build scholarship about and like create a new consensus around taking into account the meta discursive rule of the game where like people are allowed to say, well, wait a second, maybe there's some value, right, to this vision of the country as a melting pot. And like maybe like we won't actually be able to live within diversity without it, even if it has to be altered in recognition. Of what they simply have done is saying this is actually a a kind of crime that has to be policed out of existence by administrative authorities upon in universities, right? And like that is, that's the new, that's what's different. That's what's novel about like our new situation. And that's what the sort of weaponized super bug of the tra the trauma discourse has done, right? Like it's, it's, it's sort of saying that like, there's this a moral emergency where my subjective well being comes under assault when I'm exposed to certain ideas. And this notion, of course, couldn't be more antithetical to like the very concept, right? Like of a university or a public sphere at all, right? Like it is like fundamentally an authoritarian idea. And yet it's an, an authoritarian idea that takes the form of like, I will suffer unless this person is suppressed, right? And like, and, and, and so it sets up this like very poisonous dynamic where people will then compete, right? Like to have the, to have, to, to, to wield the largest weaponized superbug version of this so that they can strike down any uh, opposing arguments and never have to engage. And it's like, there's like this open question about whether institutions are going to be able to preserve, right? Like the, the, the sort of underlying medical discursive rules of the game where for instance, like a lawyer is allowed to take on a controversial client, right? And like, that's not gonna, that's not going to do harm to students that he happens to be teaching, right? Like that was something that was always controversial. And yet like people understood that to be like a cardinal value of the, of the university. And, and the, you know, there was an attempt by, you know, uh, Jeannie put together a coalition at, at Harvard Law School attempting to, you know, assert that like, of course, like, Ronald Sullivan is a defense attorney. This is what he does. He defends controversial and sometimes despised people. And he can do that while like being effective in his, in his other roles and duties. And, and, you know, and, and so like you quoted, you quoted me quoting her saying like, you know, I think reason is going to prevail here and people are going to recognize that like there's an important value here and that's going to trump these other concerns. And of course, like the other concerns are real and yet the other concerns are, the content of them is, is that they, they do reject the, the idea that that, that that can happen. They, they sort of, that there's this like emergency claim that like my 
well-being is at stake and therefore everything else has to be sacrificed to it. And whether or not like that sense of well-being is sort of cynically being deployed in order to get one's ends or whether like it is actually the case that, that one experiences it as such like each of those each of those different possibilities are both like really troubling in different ways like to the extent that it is true that we have raised a generation of people who who are not able to like make the distinction in their minds between a professional function that one serves that is part of the way an adversarial legal system works right on the one hand versus like how it makes me feel right like there is an actual like an activist set of doctrines that says that the latter should win and the institution weighed in on the side of those who were there the institution said yes we agree with those who say that like my claim that like i'm under like an, a, an immediate emotional emergency on the basis of trauma because being around this person who's doing this thing right this detested thing by defending this detestable person right in, in a court of law like they like the university actually said no those people are right right like those people should win and like that that is that is where the kind of and and you quoted me uh, she didn't say that to me she said that in the new yorker she says like oh we don't need a totalitarian government we just need to be so sort of subdued right into into silence and to fear by social uh, by, by the fear of social sanction right and and that's something that like exists outside of institutions right like if you're able to persuade enough people who are of your social cohort that like this is like an ugly thing to do and you shouldn't be doing it then like people will stop doing it and and like controversial people will not be able to to find a uh, legal representation which will end up compromising the legitimacy of the rule of law and once it's done in one particular area for one special reason it opens up the possibility for that to infect the rest of the system and so like the you know the way i sort of i see genie and i portrayed her in my uh profile over in the chronicle education of, of higher education was you know like look i i'm not a controversial person right like i'm not some heterodox figure like i am actually just like reminding people that like these are the values that are at the core of this institution and that define it going back to right like you know whatever the 12th century you know like whatever period where we decided upon our system of law that for the most part has stood the test of time that like ought to be critiqued and has been critiqued very fruitfully and must be reformed and has been reformed and will be continually reformed and criticized as we go forward but that like we're not going to do it by like throwing in the trash right like certain principles in favor of oh like you know my emotions are such that like like you know all of these thing all of this all of these like procedural niceties don't matter anymore right so um anyway that's like how i saw her. that's how i tried to frame her and 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 I'm always looking for people who are fulfilling that function, who are saying, no, look, there's this like weird peer pressure that's happening that is has been weaponized by social media, right? Because like social media is like, is this is this place, is this, is this like yes. powerful instrument of peer pressure that some opportunistic figures using the discourse of trauma and of harm and um, have, have managed to hijack for their own purposes. And it's like, no, institutions like still have to fulfill their function. People ensconced within them still have a role of saying, no, this is actually, this is actually the normal thing, right? Like, pe like lawyers get to represent clients and they get to represent controversial clients and we let them do that. So there's, there's a lot here and I want to, um, in the interest of time, um, cause there's a lot of, um, topics I, I, I want us to get to, but I want to just, um, flag within here. Cause again, being constantly in the mindset of, well, we're in this quagmire, we're in this, we're in this mess, this morass. What is our way forward? What is our way out? I wanted to flag, and I know um, he's been cited um, in in some of the work being described. 
Jonathan Haidt um, and some of the work of others like him, like him and and Jean Twenge um, in her book, iGen, um, which really chronicles some of the data around, um, and this was really front and center of, of Andrew's campaign, um, the data around the introduction of smartphones and social media and the clear data illustrating a rise in anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation among um, teenage girls in particular. And so I think two, two core tenets, uh, again, in terms of um, policy um, sort of federal level um, solutions that may, might affect this on, on an interpersonal, on an institutional level. One is um, protection of data property rights and regulation of these platforms, because part of part of what Wesley is referring to in the ability of a handful of, let's say, trolls uh, to dominate the conversation is by the nature of the algorithm and by the nature of the algorithm enhancing and promoting the sharing of, of outreach. And the more sensational and outrageous a content or claim is, the more it's likely to gain traction. And then the other component is the, the social and cultural implications of an idea like the freedom dividend, like a universal basic income, where people like Eric Weinstein have, have commentated on this, that if you look at the, the dominance of, let's say, this narrow slice of activist um, uh, sort of internet online um, commentary that is sort of lurking in the background of this entire conversation, that I partially hope to just crowd out and fill with alternatives. But if you look at that, it's partly by the nature of incentives. So, and this, this, this ties back to our conversation about fundamental truth and lies in institutions, right? So we've been fed um, from, from birth, this narrative around the American dream and this narrative around, um, for instance, um, the ability to secure uh, higher education, a house, a home, which we'll get back to in a second, um, and a secure livelihood and a footing um, if you put in a certain amount of input and work. And now what we're seeing is with the precarity of the knowledge economy, with the precarity of the gig economy, where even if you attended college, if you were one of the top third of the population that attended college, you're almost 50% um, likely to be underemployed and work in a job that doesn't even require that degree. So um, people who are in the uh, blockchain space now, for example, are um, kind of relishing um, or um, watching the collapse of institutions whose business models have not made sense for a while, where people accumulate now one and a half trillion dollars plus in student loan debt to then um, not actually use them or apply them um, in careers or jobs. So this is, I think, an economic and incentive framing that maybe provides a backdrop um, for some of the social and cultural um, issues and trends that we've been talking about. But I want to use this to maybe pivot to where Wesley and Jeannie, I think, first collided, um, at least in the public space. Um, and this was around um, an even more fraught issue around truth and institutions and lies in the space of Me Too, domestic violence, um, and how the law treats um, sexual assault. In this piece that Wesley described, the revolt of the feminist law professors. Um, so I wanna um, maybe pivot a little bit to um, really that, that collision because it seems so central, uh, but also rooted in these ideas. Well, so to pick up on that, it is, um, undeniable that the discourse of trauma is central to the area of sexual assault, the area of domestic violence, and, um, and now increasingly even just ordinary matters on campus regarding say classroom discourse, or uh, as Wesley was referring to, just your feelings about whether a teacher might be expressing certain points of view or taking on a controversial client. So the, um, the idea that one is psychologically traumatized has become an extremely important rubric and it's only going to increase with um, 
this period of time in which, you know, I think all of us, I think it's going to be fair to say all of us are going to know people who um, get extremely sick, um, who die, who really struggle. Um, and, and the actual, you know, suffering that we experience is going to become far more a part of all of our lives than we ever imagined it could be. And, um, and so what I want to say, first of all, is there is real suffering and there is real suffering in even the things that, um, Wesley, you might not be so keen to think of as real suffering, like, you know, encountering ideas that are deeply offensive or deeply disturbing to one. I do think there is a generational issue here. And it's one thing that I never um, really get tired of, of pointing out. I, I truly think that there's a generational issue. Jonathan, like, I think you're in your 20s. Um, and, you know, I think Wesley, Wes and I are in our 40s. Um, and Paget, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in between. I'm in between. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just, I really do think there's a generational issue here on, on, on trauma and on many things that, you know, we did, you know, we in our teen and college years, we're not accustomed to talking about ourselves as traumatized or really other people as traumatized. We really thought about trauma as something that happened um, to people who were um, at concentration camps during the Holocaust or who had been like, you know, uh, who had, you know, maybe witnessed people being killed. Um, that's the kind of thing that we thought of as trauma, right? The word and the concept. And we've seen over the decades, the use of the concept become more and more and more common to describe lots of things that are not completely extraordinary and out of, you know, normal experience, right? So that sometimes things that, things that are normal, and for example, as, as people have come to understand the high rates of sexual assault that do exist, um, say on college campuses, right? That it's that you can't say, oh, that's such a rare thing to occur, right? That you'd be sexually harassed or sexually assaulted, right? So the rareness that that was attached to being traumatized has gone away. So that things that happen to you or things that can happen to you in a normal, ordinary life is thought of. That that is also thought of as traumatic. So much so that almost, you know, just going into a classroom seems fraught with risk of trauma. Reading a newspaper or watching a movie seems fraught with risk of trauma. One of the interesting things that I, um, I always wondered about when people started talking about trigger warnings and about, you know, having to warn people that they might be traumatized if they read this book or um, study this topic. I thought to myself, does it actually help people to not suffer as much? Like if you give them a warning and say this, you might find this traumatic. Is does it actually make them feel less pain emotionally and less likely to feel traumatized? And so you're supposed to give them an opening to leave at that moment and, and avoid it. I think. Oh, so that, that that is how some people handle it, and other people, right. it's just a warning so that you can be prepared. Right, right. You can be prepared for what's coming, and then maybe that can help you. But you know what. And recently there was a study in Richard McNally's lab at Harvard, at Harvard University, he's in the psychology department, where he did, he, he ran these experiments and, 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 did it, and he did get a result that was significant, which is that sometimes telling people they are going to experience emotional pain really does prime them to suffer more as a result, that it would in fact have been better not to tell them that they're going to experience emotional pain, mm -hmm. um, they would be that they would be better off if, if what you're trying to do is minimize suffering and minimize that feeling of being traumatized. In fact, it might not be the best thing for all of the people in charge, like the grown-ups, the, the teachers, the administrators around all these students to be constantly telling them that there's going to be trauma awaiting them around every corner. And then in fact, it actually may ratchet up the, the levels of anxiety that we know that, um, people are already um, very vulnerable to during this time. Yes, and I think there are many concentric circles 
around this that go from the individual. And if we think about just the idea of cultivating and building resilience, not just in people and anti-fragility, not just in people, but in systems, in ways of governance. If we look at this pandemic as an example, as a, as a lens, the, um, the idea of outsourcing all personal protective equipment production or relying on basic medical supplies um, upon the hyper-efficient supply chain of global capitalism, it's, I think in many ways, what, what you've been describing um, and calling out on the level of the person, of the individual, let's say in the classroom or in an organization, we're seeing this hyper-fragility that we've built into systems um, on a national level. And the only part where I might diverge a bit with Wesley on what he has said is that I, I don't emphasize so much the idea that this might be like opportunistic or um, like disingenuous. I, I genuinely do think, Wesley, that people in their 20s who are going through experiences like, you know, school. So the, their actual uh, subjectivity has changed. To their imagine. subjectivity has changed and that the, there is, in fact, more pain and suffering associated with being a young person today then possibly we were, we were, you know. There just seems to be some kind of psychological law of conservation of, of distress where sort of as, you know, like our, you know, our parents, you know, they, they, they encountered death and suffering, right? And, and, and but like, it, it just seems like as you remove, <laughs> As you remove those stimulus, like your your ability to feel pain sort of expands, like you know, in in inverse proportion to the size of the actual stimulus. So, um, is this like kind of an example? I know this is kind of way off, and maybe even an inappropriate example, but like, and I hate to I hate to throw my fiance under the bus right now, but um, <laughs> so <laughs> sorry. Um, a couple of months ago, he got really sick for like six weeks straight, right? And he was sweating, all, like he, he, he couldn't go to work and he was like, this is the sickest I've ever been in my life. Didn't go to the hospital, didn't call for ER or anything like that. Now, I actually asked him, if you had gotten that sick now, do you think you would have gone mm -hmm. to the hospital? And mm -hmm. he's like, probably, right? He's like, he would have probably thought he was dying, you know, all this stuff. You know, I had a cough like for a while, um, for about three weeks, it was like cough and, you know, sneezing. And then all of a sudden I thought that I had, you know, the, the disease and everything. And then I was thinking, well, should I, I need to get tested. I need to do this. I need to do that. Right. Um, and so are you saying that like the effect of this is that it's actually like just also kind of overburdening our systems, you know, it's like causing people to not be able to sort of have um, a level of independence um, and be able to, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess like, you know, how do you, how do you tackle something like that? Like what's the, what's the cure for the oversensitivity to certain things that could just be life experiences? Like my cough would have never noticed it a year ago, would have never thought one thing about it, but it's just like, yeah, I have a cough, whatever. Right. So like, you know, um, are we just entering into this like age of being overly sensitive to everything? And is that detrimental to us um, on a larger scale, like what are the big implications of this, you know, um, and how does this affect like our general sense of, I don't know, well-being and success? Like, so, I, yeah, it's a little bit loaded to say that it's overly sensitive. Although, you know, I see why you're saying it because of the example that you gave that like, right. <laughs> yeah, that was a cough, it may just be a cough and no need to think that immediately you're dying. Um, you know, there is an analog there in that um, some of the disturbing, you know, part of education, that part of the point of it is that it should be disturbing, it should be challenging, it should make you feel uncomfortable. That that's that's always been what an education does, that it 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 you you encounter ideas that really make you mad or upset, and that that's that's the struggle that you want people to have in order to grow. Um, and at the same time, um, I I think that as say a teacher, and and Wesley, you're also a kind of teacher because you explain ideas to the public and to your readers. Um, that's a kind of teaching too. You, you know, it's there's a there's a truth telling 
function that is extremely important, I think, to a lot of people who engage in this work and a lot of artists and people who put um, expressive activity out there for other people to um, encounter. But there's a way in which it's not going to be heard. It's not going to be effective if you don't sort of meet people where they are and address them in a way that they will be able to receive. And so, you know, instead, I think that there is a temptation that I have indulged in it myself at various times um, where you just say, oh my goodness, the world is going to pot because it's so different from the way it was when we were young and the way we were young, when we dealt with it, we just dealt with it and, we, and that was, you know, in some way a better way to deal with it. Well, there are pluses and minuses. And here, one of the minuses I've been pointing to is that people may suffer more. Young people may suffer more right. as a result of the trauma framing. So what's the fine line? It like is. Where, where is that fine line? Do we even know how to define what that is? I think that one of the things is acceptance that uh, I think that as a 40 something, um, it's been important for me to accept that these are, this is the way uh, things are for people of a different generation than I am. And that in order to talk to people of multiple generations, including people who are in that kind of frame of mind, that's not exactly the one that I, I share, um, that it's, uh, you know, instead of saying, oh my God, the tide's coming in and the tide's coming out, you just have to kind of get on the boat and, and ride the tide. So and I actually, so it's so interesting to hear this from Eugenia, because I have to so strongly disagree. I think oh, one okay. of the most, I think one of the most fundamental tenets for me is to not accept, uh, and this is not what you're saying, but to not accept any inevitability or teleology, even along generational lines. And I know coming into, like, I'm the sort of anecdotal case of what Height has been tracking in his data, right? Entering um, entering Harvard at a certain point and, and coming through graduate school. And even, you know, back in, in 2012, like, the, the ideas around speech as violence and trauma and all of the freighted language around this, that was not omnipresent. No. And I came into Harvard Law School and I, I had been trained. I had been, my brain had been rewired to frame myself. A and I mean, again, just, <laughs> I, I, I framed myself as, um, how did I put it? Um, I am the son of Middle Eastern immigrants uh, with an invisible disability. Hold on. Uh, uh, queer. Uh, and like five five other labels in order to gain acceptance, to gain social entry into the uh, LGBT group on campus. That was a mandate. I had to I had to at the door illustrate my sufficient intersectionality to claim space in that environment. And when I extricated myself from this, moved to Iowa, <laughs> basically <laughs> like traversed the state ten thousand miles on my own in a van, and like beat the drum about this random Asian guy nobody had heard of. Uh, <laughs> I I mean, it felt like the greatest blessing. One of the greatest gifts that the Yang campaign offered to me was freedom. Because I remember in the in the earliest days, he he asked me, he was like, John, like, can you write an, an email to our to our um, you know, um, our supporters? This was back in like early or late late 2018, just to kind of explain like why the fuck you're doing this? Why would you you know, leave um, and and kind of move out to Iowa on a whim. And I was like, sure, happy to. And I get the response right after saying, too dark, let's lighten up. <laughs> because, And I mean, it was like funny now to kind of reflect on that, but I had been trained for years. There was nothing inevitable about this. There was dozens and scores and hundreds of faculty and administrators who sat by the wayside and let this just wave come across them mm. in part, I think due to the dangerous thinking that like, oh, it's just how it is. It's just how young people are. We just got to button up, not say, um, not say the truth. Um, mm -hmm. And I think to me, one of the greatest freeing elements of, of this movement and of, I think we lost Wesley. Um, I know. Oh, let's add him back. <laughs> add to stream. There we go. Um, is, was was the ability to say like you know there's this quote from from unger which is um hope is not the cause of action action is the cause of hope 
And being able to have a movement, to have a space, to have a group of people that validated the idea that we don't have to rank ourselves and sort ourselves and use identity as a barrier, but as a bridge, to me, it was mind blowing. It was radical. And that's just why I won't ever accept uh, and I know this is not what you're suggesting, but this in inevitability, this kind of generational. Um, is, no. Jonathan, no, that was, that was so, I just want to, what you just said about how, you know, like you were basically conditioned to frame yourself as a victim to an extent or like. Oh, I mean, that's, that's yeah. how you win. That's, right, I mean, that's right. how I was trained to, to gain social currency, to gain <sighs> elevated stature. Exactly. I mean, we are, we are primed from the earliest age. And this is, I mean, Jeannie, you know, Hunter starts in seventh grade. Like we are training people from, you know, the earliest of ages. People are taking IQ tests in New York City at the ages of three and four, and um, we. And to me, it's 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 so fundamental, and it is volitional. It's a choice, and this is so why wait, I'm so. You were saying ahead. this was not omnipresent at Harvard in 2012, but but it, so. it was there at Hunter in 2000, whatever. You, you were getting it at Hunter. So you were not, ahead of the curve. So not 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 at Hunter, but because everything is downstream of college admissions, because wow. everything is college preparatory. Um, I mean, for example, I was told, and this was always you know a chip on my shoulder was never say Israel, never say Israel on your application. Don't mention the kind of Jewishness. Um, I mean, there's just there's there's so many elements of this. Um, but yeah, from from the earliest days. These are very clear social rewards and signals for what oh, language. I mean, it's a form of social engineering that has been hijacked by a bunch of people with this very specific political agenda to just like that. That's why you don't say Israel, right? And it's why you strive to be a different sort of Asian, right? Um, or, or you just happen to be one. Um, but, um, but, but uh, I, I'm going to give just like an anecdote uh, that, that could speak to. Like there's this whole question about like, oh, has the actual like deep subjectivity changed or is it just like this politically factitious uh, thing? And I'm gonna give an anecdote. A friend of mine, um, he gave a commencement speech at a, uh, at, a, at, at, at a University of Colorado, one of those campuses. And uh, in the middle of the speech, there was a student who got up and began berating him for not making an acknowledgement that it was Native American land and so on. And he had sort of made these, he had sort of, although he was very conscious of the, the sort of the Native American whatever um, thing out there, he had sort of soft peddled it for a mostly white audience. And, and so his, his sort of person yelling at him sort of then went on Twitter and did this whole stream, you know, white supremacy, so on. And whatever, so this happened and, you know, like, then the next day, he got an email from an administrator saying, I understand that you, this, this is the commencement speaker. And he's not even a student or in any way affiliated with a college. But like, I, I got a report that you were the victim of a bias incident of a student, right? Like harassing you and sort of, you know, like, and I just want you to know that you have all these resources at your disposal. There's, you know, you can talk, like, he's not even, he just was brought in to give a speech, but like, and then the next day he got, he got another email from another unrelated office at the university saying, following up on this bias incident that, you know, you were, you were assailed. And I, I just want you to know there's all these other resources, counseling and so on. And, you know, and he was like, look, I don't want the student to be disciplined. I do not, I don't consider it a bias incident. It was annoying. He was wrong. And, but like he's allowed to say what he wants, right? And so it just shows that like it's it's not actually it's not like they were going after the woke person as the harasser, right? It, it was just that like you have these people whose job it is to to enforce these rules, and and and, so right. there is, and so like there is this like professional cadre of people who have colonized these institutions who are running around searching for anything that can be construed as, and he's like, of course I wasn't traumatized by this. Of course I don't need therapy because some annoying student yelled at me, but like that, that is what they are being taught by the, the professionals and the people in charge. So, so to, to Jeannie's point around the bureaucracy and the bureaucratization um, 
of intimacy, for example, I think this is what Eric Weinstein refers to as the embedded growth obligation of institutions. So mm -hmm. one of the examples is the Southern Poverty Law Center um, that they, they often cite to um, where um, um, a, an activist named Madre Nawaz, for example, was deemed to be uh, engaged in hateful speech, um, even though he was um, trying to reform uh, Islam progressively from within. And he ended up winning this series of, of lawsuits uh, defending himself against the SPLC. But I think it provides, an, again, this interesting economic and incentive frame against what seems to be these intractable social and cultural issues that actually a lot of them are maybe derivative or downstream of incentives and institutions needing administrators and bureaucrats and needing to grow and grow and grow by the nature of their balance sheets. Um, I wanted to give space for Jeannie and Padre to respond to this. I'm very mindful of our time as well. We haven't even gotten to sex robots. <laughs> <laughs> what? No sex robots? Oh, no. <laughs> I, I think that I, I, want, I want to just briefly say about that, the point about the bureaucracy, you know, it is tempting to, with Wesley, wonder is this a kind of a hijacking of our institutions and our disciplinary systems by one ideology, but it's not because that ideology is fickle. Any ideology will fit into the sort of the incentives of the bureaucracy, the workings of the bureaucracy and it can be turned on a dime. Um, so I, it's, it's, it's far beyond just representing one set of views or one set of people. It's, it's something far more than that. And it very much is, it goes back to our conversation about institutions versus individuals. There are lots of uh, things that in institutions can do um, that can support people, but there are lots of ways in which when you don't have individuals with actual free, discourse really using their real judgment and reason to say hey this is crazy you see institutions completely get out of hand yeah um i don't know if i'm i'm touching upon uh what you were talking about exactly jonathan but um i think you know when we're talking about like what are some of the ways out of this <laughs> quagmire or whatever the situation that we're in with institutions and then like ideologies being used um, by institutions and the overbloating and bureaucracy around everything in our lives now, seemingly. Um, you know, I think it actually goes back to, and I hate bringing this up, but it goes back to kind of like what I was trying to actually allude to. I don't know if I did a good job with Andrew Yang's op-ed, which was, um, you know, I think we need to do a little better of a job. And you know what, Jonathan, you touched upon this too, your time um, in school, which is, um, by not just playing the victim, but that does not mean just saying like, oh, woe is me, I'm just gonna accept whatever it is that comes my way, but like taking us, being able to deal with adversity and challenges and things that are unfair because the world is inherently unfair at times, you're gonna experience it and be able to strengthen from it and um, you know, not have to rely on an institution all the time or someone else to kind of deal with it. Mm -hmm. And if you do have to rely on like, you know, an institution, come to that institution with strength as opposed to just victimhood, because I think that just changes everything. It changes like how you see yourself, you know, moving through life. It also just reframes all the situations in your life to come from a place of actually, you know, um, like actually forming a stronger identity, um, you know, becoming a stronger human being, but becoming more resilient. So at times you don't just resort to the victim mentality of, oh, I need this institution to help me out of this, or, oh, I need like, you know, counseling to do this for me, or, you know, or I need to turn to this person, but it's actually taking a little bit. I think it, I think part of the answer lies in just autonomy and just independence and, and, um, and, you know, and not playing the victimhood, like being your own hero to an extent, whatever that means for you, speaking out, um, if that means, you know, wearing the flag or whatever, but, you know, some combination of whatever that looks like for you so that you can be the hero of your own life. I think we have to change the narrative for ourselves. It, like it starts with us individually. So I want to go around um, and go around for just for final comments and reflections. Um, and I just want to touch off something Padre just alluded to, um, which again, for me, this kind of obsession, this focus 
um, on an idea, on a solution, not a panacea, but like the freedom dividend, like a universal basic income, is on on even these personal levels, on the ability to have the courage to express truth, to, to call things as they are, to not be conditional upon the validation or approval of anyone. And um, that for me even goes within the home, right? Um, where the idea that um, your, um, your truth and your values and your perspective you can do the things you want to do, live the life you want to lead, not conditional upon the approval or validation of anyone. Um, and again, not a panacea, not going to solve these seemingly intractable social issues, but I think will elevate, elevate the tenor and the possibility um, because people will be able to live and provide um, for themselves. So I want to go around, give everyone a chance to reflect, to conclude. Um, and before that, I'll just say um, thank you so, so much. Um, I feel like this could have gone on for two hours, five hours, 10 hours. There are so many topics I would have loved to have gotten to, again, including sex robots. Please read Jeannie. <laughs> Seriously, um, sex please robots. read Columbia Jeannie's Law Columbia Review. Law Review piece on sex robots. It will blow your mind. It is incredible. <laughs> And if you want you to take to part, that. oh yes, we have to link it. Um, if you want to take part in more dialectics, I haven't like gotten it, around to that one yet. But yeah, what's that? I haven't gotten around to that one yet, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, you have to, you have to. It's great. Um, we're going to be having on entrepreneur and CEO Dan Price next Thursday, April 23rd, um, 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. We're going to be having on people like Michael Sandel, uh, the acclaimed political philosopher. We're bringing on amazing people. So if you have people you want on, like Incredible Minds you had today, please comment, subscribe to Jonathan Herzog on YouTube. This is also streamed on Padgett's, on The Zach and Matt Show. We have Jeannie and Wesley's socials and ways to get in touch with them as well. Um, I'll let you all um, go around, conclude, reflect, but thank you all so, so much. Um, yeah. Just so grateful for all of you. I'll just say thanks. Is this, this was a lot of fun? Uh, yeah, uh, it's a uh, it's been interesting, and uh, I guess um, uh, <laughs> it's oh that was it. Oh my gosh, I was <laughs> like I just laughed because it's it's been interesting. Um, no, um, I really enjoyed this. I know that I'm totally out credentialed here. I'm like the least credentialed. Oh, person. Yeah, come on. Um, but I definitely have opinions as you guys can tell. But um, all I would say is that I, I'm really grateful, um, Jonathan, for bringing us all on. And also, um, you know, like you said, with just Andrew Yang's campaign, I think he brought something really special was that, you know, you don't have to just put yourself into a bucket, right? Like there is like value in just like, um, in just coming together from all different kinds of backgrounds, all different ideologies and coming up with solutions to move everyone just forward together um, and not having to draw those lines. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just very, very thankful that I was able to connect with this entire community. So thank you, Jonathan, for being a part of that and, and continuing to, you know, push that forward in your, in your candidacy. And please, if you haven't heard of or followed Wesley Yang's work or Jeannie Sue Gerson's work, you must. They are incredible, brilliant, really just like the best minds of our generation. Um, and they're gonna just gonna grow and grow and grow um, until they take over. <laughs> so please follow them, read their work, listen to their um, YouTube content. Um, it's just continually inspiring um, and motivating for me because political courage and just courage generally is contagious. So mm -hmm. can't thank you guys enough. Thank you. Thank you.